A version control system allows developers to manage different versions of their files. Now, managing different versions of code means two things. Developers can move back and forth in time between different versions of the code, and multiple developers can work on the same files at the same time without chaos. So let's talk about version control as a sort of time machine first. Uh, professional software companies need the ability to go back to different versions of their code. They'll often sell and maintain different versions of their products at the exact same time, as you can see in this table. So there's a purchase price to buy the software initially, and then there's opportunities to get new features over time by purchasing upgrades. And each new numbered version holds new features. For some software companies, this model encourages customers to keep coming back and giving the company more and more money and smaller, more palatable increments. Uh, this affordable upgrade path is a, really a smart approach to retaining customers while keeping them happy. Now, software companies that sell different versions of the same software need to be able to recreate the state of each of the files at Im important milestones. Why? Well, if there's a bug in the software, most customers expect a bug to be fixed or patched for free. And this is almost universally expected for paid software these days. When a company finds out that there was a bug introduced in, let's say, version 1.1, they have to decide how to fix it. Now, a naive approach for a company would be to only have one version of all the files that make up their product. Then, after a new numbered version is released, they would immediately begin building new features on that one copy of the files that make up the product. Now, if a company only maintains their code for the latest and greatest version of the product, then they can't really go back in time and fix the previous versions. So if this is the case, and the company wants to do right by their customers, then the company would not much have much choice but to fix the bug in the latest version, say version 2.1, and then give that version to all the customers who have versions 1.1, 2.0, and 2.1. The problem is that some of the customers have only paid for features in version 1.1 and 2.0. Uh, the customers would essentially be getting the new features up through version 2.1 for free. And this is not ideal from the company's perspective. Uh, for this reason, companies need a way to go back in time, fix a bug, and release a patch without giving away new features for free. Now remember that all software is created from many different source code files. Each file, we say, has a different state at a given point in time. And this is just another way of saying that the contents of the files change over time. With a version control system, one can, in fact, change the view of the file system to go back in time, at least in the code, to recreate exactly what each file looked like at important milestones. A development team can then build on top of the code to fix a bug and release a patch without having to give customers new uh, features in later versions. So it's possible to create a new line of development at a previous state and fix a bug where it was discovered. Then, since all the future versions are kind of built on top of that version, let's say 1.1, that fix can be easily merged into the future versions and released to customers without giving them uh, the features they haven't paid for. So this is an example of where a bug was fixed and that fix was combined in each released version of the software. So going back in time is one of the most important features of a version control system. However, the most important use of a version control system is that it makes it easy for groups of developers to work concurrently. This means having multiple people be able to work on the same files at the same time without chaotic conflicts. And avoiding chaos in life is always desirable. So imagine if two developers each had to make an addition to a single file, let's say main.cpp, in order to implement two new features. Well, each one could first make a copy uh, from a remote file server onto their local machine and then each could make the changes that they need to make. Uh, they could test that code and verify that it works. So these two steps are the easy parts. Things get difficult in step three when two or more people have to combine their work together. So one of the most important points I'm trying to make in the course is that working alone is usually simple compared to working with others. Working with others adds complexity. But if you want to get anything big done in a reasonable amount of time, then it's necessary. You have to have this complexity. 
we have to be able to have multiple developers working on different things at the same time. So the question is, how would we get all of the changes back to the remote server without losing someone's code? If Alice uploads her changed copy of main.cpp back first, and then Bob uploads his updated copy of main.cpp right afterwards, then he's going to wipe out all of Alice's changes. And this is obviously not good. Of course, with some communication between Bob and Alice, uh, this could be made to work. They could work together before anyone uploads their version to figure out you know, what part of each one's main.cp need to make it back into the version that's going to be stored on the server. So even in this simple scenario, it would be a difficult process to manage that uh, communication, and it would require a lot of manual coordination. Now multiply this by a thousand developers and tens of thousands of files, and you can see that it would be literally impossible to work on a large uh, piece of software on a team without some special tools. Version control systems allow developers to manage their files by making it easy to create branches and then allowing the branches to be merged together into new versions. A branch is a new line of development that is separate from other branches. It's not unusual for a developer to create a new branch each time they add a new feature, they fix a bug, they refactor some code, or just want to experiment on the code with some changes. Now if that line of development doesn't end up being useful, the branch can be discarded and the team can go back to the branch's starting point. If the line of development is useful, then the branch can be merged into the master branch and shared with the rest of the team. So a merge is when two lines of development are combined together into one. If a developer has completed a feature or a bug fix, it needs to be combined into the main line of the development. It needs to be merged into the latest and greatest version of the code so that the rest of the team has access to the changes. Concurrent development is the hallmark of working on a team. We don't want developers to have to take turns checking out a file and then blocking everyone else from doing any work. Now sometimes the changes from two branches in a merge can be combined automatically by the version control system. But other times human intervention is required to iron out some conflicts. So a case where the merge process is automatic might be when Bob works on lines 800 to 850 of main.cpp to fix a bug, and Alice works on lines 100 to 150 to add a new feature. Since neither developer's code has interfered with each other, they're in really different parts of the file, the version control system can merge the two together without needing a human to intervene. Now, version control systems can merge each developer's changes together without Bob and Alice having to coordinate, and this is called an automatic merge. On the other hand, if both Bob and Alice are each changing the lines 800 to 850 in their own branches, then there's no real way for the version control system to know which of the changes need to stay and which need to go. So here's an example of something that might happen. So we have some code here. The line with the if has a distinct change from each developer. Each developer uh, made the changes to fulfill some feature request or some bug fix. In other words, some version of both sets of these codes needs to be in the final version of the code. When merging these two sets of changes together, however, how could the version control system tool know how to combine these two versions automatically? It can't. The version control system has no idea what each developer's changes actually mean. So Bob and Alice, they must get together and discuss how their changes uh, should be combined and merged together. Now these are usually relatively easy issues to iron out, but it does take human intervention and communication to pull off. In my experience, these types of manual merges are relatively rare, but they do happen occasionally. Automated branching and merging is what allows more than one developer to work on the same files at the same time without much chaos. Each developer's branch is their own, and the tool can handle many merges automatically. A commit is a snapshot of a repository at a fixed point in time. One can have many commits on a branch. You can think of a commit kind of like taking a photograph for posterity. The code will be immortalized at that commit point. 
Now commit is made whenever the developer feels the code is in a good enough place that someone might actually want to go back to it in exactly the same state. Usually this is after some code has been written and successfully tested. So the feature or bug fix doesn't necessarily have to be fully complete, but it usually represents the completion of a sub-step that made some progress towards final completion. There might be 10 commits on a branch to add a new feature. Uh, each commit brings the code a little bit closer to being finished. Now it's possible that the developer might want to roll back to a previous commit if an experiment fails or if they want to try a different approach. Once a feature is completely finished, the branch then can be merged into the master branch of development. Now let me take a moment to say that this approach to managing files is completely different than how students manage their code. Students usually only have to worry about one version of their code, the one they hand in for a grade. Students almost always work on the code by themselves, and then they usually never have to or want to look at it again. So this is okay while you're in school because most of what you do is just between you and your professors. However, in the real world, you will be working with many other teammates and you will be adding and editing the same code for years and possibly decades. Therefore, it makes sense to become familiar with version control and to start using it while in school. So many normal people, and, and by normal I mean non-software engineers, happily never use version control. Now, often these people will use uh, different file names to manage the different versions of their files. So an advantage of this approach is that copying a file is easy and you can always go back to a previous version of your work. Now this can work if you only have a few different versions and you're working alone. And I'm sure everyone watching this video has done something like this in the past. Now managing the history of files can be tricky for an application. Most applications don't do it very well. There are some software applications though that have really good historical information built into the app. So some photo editing and drawing tools that I'm aware of have a very good history mechanism. You can undo and redo even in between shutdowns of the app. Uh, wikis, for example, they also manage and track all of the changes. If you, if you look at Wikipedia, you can actually see how all of the articles have evolved. Version control systems, however, are mostly used by developers for source code rather than application-specific file formats like Word documents or image files or even compiled executable code. This is because when there's a conflict, we humans can read the source code in its natural state. The files don't need to be transformed into some other form for us to read them. Now, of course, this is not entirely true. Text editors do interpret new line characters for us, and they end the line in the editor. Uh, in the file, however, there is there is no idea of a line at all. A file is just a group of bytes that have certain meaning to certain applications. An image file can, in fact, be opened in a text editor and read. However, we can't make much sense of the raw image data in an editor. We need a program that transforms that data into an actual image. So here's an image uh, interpreted by a photo program on the left and the exact same image file opened in a text editor on the right. So it's the same file being interpreted differently by two different programs. Being able to read and understand the raw data, the source code in this case, is going to be important when it comes to having the version control tool help us resolve conflicts that can happen between different people's code. So when Bob and Alice both edited the same line of code before, that was called a conflict. They had to get together and decide what the combined line should look like. And this is part of the merging process. Being able to understand the raw data is critical for them to figuring out how to merge their code together. Almost all mer version control systems identify conflicts in the raw files by finding lines in the file where the versions differ. In other words, most version control systems are line oriented. This implies that the new line character has special significance to version control systems. The new line, of course, is that special character that identifies the end of a line in all simple text editors. However, in an image or a binary executable, the byte that makes up the new line character doesn't have any real significance. Okay, this makes it difficult to use version control systems on any file that doesn't use new line characters. In other words, most version control tools are simple text file oriented tools. They don't integrate with other tools like photo viewing software. 
Source code works well because we don't really need complicated software to interpret the raw data for us. With the exception of the editor using the new line character to decide when to end the line, there isn't much that the editors do to our raw text. We humans can interpret the differing versions and make a decision about how they should be merged together. Because the raw differences in an application-specific binary format don't mean that much to us, uh, we usually don't use version control for non-source code. Okay, so in the past, say the pre-2000s, most version control systems were centralized. This means that every commit and every snapshot taken had to go to a server and it was stored there. The advantage to this is that there's one place that everyone knows where to find the latest and greatest code. That's, that's pretty powerful. This has a couple of different problems though. So since all version control system operations have to go through the server, there can be contention for the centralized server for large teams. So with thousands of developers working on the same code base, which that's not unusual at all, the centralized server could get bogged down because of requests ahead of yours in the queue. In other words, it doesn't scale very well for very large teams. Now there are some workarounds, like you can have replication systems, uh, but they, they basically add complexity into the system. Uh, there's a problem with open source collaboration. So most open source projects get their contributors by people choosing to work on the project without asking for any special permission. So if you're not officially associated with a project, but you wanted to play around with the code, in a centralized system, the owner would have to give you authorization, or have to give you permission to commit changes to the code on the central server. These experimental changes would then be stored and would become part of the code's permanent history. But this is just crazy. They, they would never let some stranger store their changes on the centralized server before they could verify them. Their code might be garbage, and the repository owner wouldn't want to have it be part of the project's official history. So with centralized systems, you had to make all of your changes without committing them, and then ask the originator to take them all in one big set. And this goes against the philosophy of committing at intermediate points in the development of a feature. Another problem is you need a constant internet connection, which uh, it's not really a big deal these days, but if your connection went down for some reason, you couldn't commit and move on. Instead, you had to uh, wait uh, to make your new changes until the connection was reestablished. Another problem, there's a single point of failure. If the centralized server went down, the whole team had to wait for it to be fixed before any committing could be done. So along came uh, distributed version control systems. A distributed version control system keeps a copy of the repository along with all of the changes you make to it on your machine. It's not necessary to send every single commit to a central server. Uh, since almost all of the work is done on local machines, and machines only need to communicate occasionally, uh, there's not a lot of contention, even on very large teams. So two developers only need to share their versions when they want to merge their work together, which happens pretty infrequently. Each developer can commit as much as they want, since no central server has to be involved. You can download a repository and make changes, and not involve the originator. They don't know about your changes unless you ask them to pull them in. Uh, what's more important is that you can make commits locally, so you can use all the good practices we're going to talk about while experimenting with code. You don't need a constant internet connection, since almost everything is happening on your machine. And many redundant copies are of the re whole repository are floating around. Although this may sound bad from a disk space perspective, I say who cares? Disk space is cheap. It's great from a backup perspective. So there was a version control system war, and distributed version control systems won. So you may hear of other centralized version control systems. One, there's one called Subversion or SVN. There's one called the Concurrent Versioning System, CVS. There's a really old one called the Revision Control System or RCS. And there are a few others. However, since these have fallen out of favor, all you really have to know about them is the weaknesses of centralized systems discussed before. Now, having discussed the weaknesses of centralized systems, it's important that we remember uh, one of their great strengths was that there was always a known place where the latest and greatest code lived. Now, we can still get this benefit in a distributed version control system by simply assigning one copy of the repository as the latest and greatest. 
then it's still easy to find and interact with the latest and greatest, but without the, all the problems associated with a centralized system. Now we'll see how this works when we work with GitHub. GitHub is a centralized storage location for uh, many teams distributed Git repositories. In the next video, I'll give you a demo of some basic Git usage.